Here we go. Welcome to Club Cheeks Lube. My name is Lauren C. Johnson, and I'm joined by my co-producers, Matt Carney and Dev Bott. We are the reading series and journal named after the asteroid that ended the Cretaceous era and the reign of the non-avian dinosaurs. We created this space to elevate emerging speculative fiction writers across the Bay Area and beyond. This is a space to lament, to rage, to witness, and envision a better future by way of dark fiction and music. This is catharsis, sorrow, defiance, and celebration. And when the world feels dark and hopeless, we can shine a light together with our art and the communities we build. I am so grateful that all of you are here tonight. Thank you to each and every audience member. It means the world to us and we appreciate you. Thank you to our fabulous authors and poets for sharing their incredible work. Prepare to be spellbound with Amy K. Bell, A Night Out, M. Olivas, The Man Who Fed Dilophosaurs, Doug Henderson with an excerpt from his novel, The Cleveland Heights LGBTQ Sci-Fi and Fantasy Role-Playing Club, Kiana Shaley, The Entrance, and Seer Becker, Like Voyager. With music by the inimitable DevBot, the Shipwreck Detective. We also have a tip jar. It's right there um, and if you have cash. We also have QR codes to our Venmo that we dispersed about. 100% um, of our tips go to all of the performers. We split it evenly amongst them as well as Dev. So if you are able to, please consider making a tip and to support your local authors. Thank you again, everyone, sincerely, and we will see you on the other side.
a night out. Everyone was fighting the inertia, but ultimately decided that a gathering with old friends outside of work and away from significant others was too good, too necessary to pass up. Everybody got to the restaurant on time. Everybody ordered big bowls of house special noodle soup. So cold outside, everybody remarked. Perfect day for soup. Everyone opened with how busy they'd been feeling lately, how tired and constricted by schedules. With that out of the way, there was a collective sigh, an opening of hearts. The food arrived quickly, but everybody was too engaged in conversation to begin eating immediately. You see, everyone had hired a matchmaker, and apparently the first thing the matchmaker requested was photographs of every person everybody had ever dated. Photos of your exes, what for, everyone wondered. To establish a suitable physical ideal, was the answer. Everyone laughed at this. Admittedly, everybody had a very specific type. A certain kind of person attracted them, and they seemed to attract the same right back. In fact, it was astonishing how consistently true this was, going back decades for everybody was now that old. Time and again, the same profile. Huh. Everybody mulled that over. The house special was delicious and satisfying. Unwilling to leave the convivial table, everybody ordered a dessert to share. Conversation turned to gossip, how everyone had fared during the pandemic. Everyone had gained some important insights, private revelations, unconfirmed assumptions, and finally, there was everyone's break from reality. So sad what's happening to everyone right now. Everybody had a bit of food on their face until everyone dipped a napkin in water and wiped it clean. Everyone is that kind of friend. Everybody kept shaking their head at the shape of life now, kept starting their sentences with, as you get older, you realize. After all the food was eaten, everybody got the check and stepped out onto the cold sidewalk to part ways. Everybody crossed their arms tightly and drew in close, like old times back when they'd all lived in New York. But instead of smoking, everybody vaped. Did you notice how we kept circling back to a longing, a yearning for liberation, for the release once permitted to us by youth? Everyone mused into the nighttime quiet. Everybody grimaced and nodded. Let's do something about that, damn it, everybody finally said with great conviction. Yes, we will, everybody agreed behind the plumes. Pact was made. It was the kind of promise that everyone hopes will initiate a shift, a Kairos moment. Dance in the moonlight, everybody shouted, laughing. Rituals and ecstasy, everybody whispered. No inner child shall be left behind, everybody agreed with a pang. The moon shone down on their small circle, dusted their clenched shoulders with its faint light. Everybody left feeling grateful for an intimate dinner with friends, for hot soup on a cold night, for some synchrony of purpose. If anyone could make this happen, it was them. All right, uh, this is uh, The Man Who Fed Dilophosaurs by me, Emma Levis. We used to hike up to the mountain, uh, the mountain top together, Yusuf and I, every first and third Friday of the month. We drag our wagon of fresh slaughtered beef up the rocky path, our flashlights cutting beams beneath the violet sky. I called him Yus Yusuf because he didn't like father or dad or papa, so Yusuf, he'd say to me, bleakly, I never asked him why, he'd always just been Yusuf. To the rest of our neighbors, they knew him as the man who fed Dilophosaurus. For a while, it was just him feeding them, going up and down the mountain, just like Papa Ephraim did before him. And they'd stay up to hear the hoots and caws knocking echoes against my bedroom window. He said he did it to take the edge off, keep them at bay uh, on their own hunting grounds outside the colony walls. 
They always watched us from the woods, their eyes reflecting moon glass white from the street lamp's glow. Mom used to say they were just birds and, th and would never hurt him, but I picked up the hesitation in her voice. In our house, we did not share emotions. I suppose we never learned how. Our arguments were marked by stern words and even tones, ending with echoes of gentle locks on bedroom doors. We never said, I love you. Yusuf never uttered the words, never cried out except for a single time he drank himself stupid, weeping tears into his own puddle of booze and sweat and grief uh, the morning mother died. To her, I'd say te amo, but that was all. No, her, um, her love was shown in overnight steamed tamales or a glowing pa uh, plate of red enchiladas because the words did so little and were messy, fragile things, but food took time to get right. And all those nights, I'd hear Yusuf prepare meat for his creatures, always one of our best cattle, never sickly, never too old, bleeding meat that I knew to him meant no te preocupes, yo, te, uh, yo cuidarte de ti. The first night I joined him, he, he hadn't gone in weeks. He'd cold turkeyed it after, this, after stretches of seeing them almost every night when, when mom was too sick to come home, and I too foreign a creature for him to bother staying with. I watched him from the kitchen doorways as he sat on the couch next to the spot where mom once sat, the shape of her still pressed into the cushions. Her, his eyes glazed over as grainy earth cartoons reflected off his gaze, the smell of alcohol wafting off of him, tickling under my nose. He'd done this for days and days, and I had enough of it. His groveling told him that tonight was the night I was ready to learn. He blinked and rubbed exhaustion from his eyes, asked if I was certain. I said yes, I was 16. Up there, we built a fire in the night cold, the crescent of Kepler 422B sailing above us, a swirling beige ship on a sea of black. Yusuf handed me his knife, its blade anemic thin, but it still cut as good. You know how to use this, he asked trying to make small talk when, uh, when uh, he knew the knife wasn't enough to cut the silence between us. He and I, the only two left, our shallow, sheepish breaths, the only real sounds. I've used the knife before, I said, meaner than I meant. I'd butchered before too, for years because Yusuf wanted me to be tough, because he'd caught me with Sarah in the cedar tree out back and said, full of sharp rays, um, si te vas a actuar como un pincho, hombre, debes ser fuerte como uno. But, uh, sorry. but out there, that was my first time butchering with just a knife, and not in the sterile room we had back home that smelled of lye and disinfectant. Out there, I pressed, da I pressed down the full weight of me to split a ribcage. I slit the skin and steadied my hand. I swallowed my fear and my blade drank warm iron. I didn't stop until steam rose off my arms, red from elbows to trembling fingers, and by then, it arrived. When I was young, I wanted nothing more than to see the Dilophosaurs, the keratin, the V-shaped crests atop their brows, their black feathers the color of autumn leaves. Mom never let me, but I'd wanted to show them I wasn't their weepy little girl Yusuf said I needed to grow out of. So when they materialized from the night, standing still on bent back legs, monolithic, as if they'd been there the whole time, I stood firm. This isn't for me, I told myself. This is for Yusuf and Papa Ephraim and Grandma and Mama. The stench of death clung to them. The firelight licked the edges of their head crests, their razor fangs, their spindly claws. They curved their massive bodies around us, around me to Yusuf, the heat of their breath pushing against me. Occasionally, one or two would shift their serpent necks back to catch me in the gleam of their onyx eyes. There's an old saying back on Earth, Mom used to tell me, the souls of dead sailors inhabit seagulls. When I saw them in the firelight, I thought, Dilophosaurs are birds too. The little ones were quick to rip off chunks of meat from the carcass, pinning them down uh, to the dirt with trident talons and stripping the flesh, the flesh in uh, glittering ribbons. I held my own dinner at the thought of, and fought the and fought to wretch up, but Yusuf didn't so much as notice the grisly chewing. Adrian, he called me from the mass of them, their tails cradling him. They read you, any mistrust, any malice, and they'll defend themselves. Bedomida, he'd say. He raised his hands and they brushed the snout and they brushed snouts to palms. He uh, he held out a heart or lung or liver or glistening spleen and a faint smile would emerge from the shadows to snatch it up. The smile and the meat receding back into the dark. He'd make little clicks with his lips and puckered them for when they came to, sh to sniff his musk. When they got close enough, he planted little kisses on their cheeks. My cheeks warmed. 
I fought, to, I fought the urge to turn away as if I was privy to something intimate and beautiful and horrific all at once. In their dance, I couldn't tell his shadow from theirs. He was one of them. But even while my fingers trembled, I couldn't help but smile. If Yusuf had been dying, slipping away like mom had for so many years, like I was too, trapped in that quiet, empty home, it was those dinosaurs that brought him back. He loved them. He even sang for them. That's why I could never hate Yusuf. How could I? When everyone else was against him, while Yusuf withered, a reclusive widower, widower in an old ranch house, I was the one who stomached going into town to bear the ignorant and spiteful things the people who grew up with him fired point blank. That Yusuf was crazy, senile, old, that I should have abandoned him when my mother died. And I always sucked my teeth at them, or shot insults back with my own glares and mom's wits, Yusuf meanness festering also in me. And they expected nothing less. I was Yusuf's daughter, after all, the degenerate daughter of the man who fed Dilophosaurus. But they didn't know him. They thought he was the same man he'd been decades ago. A cheat, a thug, a grifter, deserter from the war. Never mind the getting out of that line of dirty work cost him two dozen stitches in his straight posture. Everyone in this little no-name colony still feared him as, as if he were another carnivore, best left to solitude. He wasn't any of those things, though. I'd see him in the firelight, brushing his hands against the patchy feathers of Dilophosaurus. He was just lonely. You could just ditch him, Sarah had suggested to me, the last time before I ever saw her again. Sarah, who wore bright colors, whereas I wore too much black, and said she liked the contrast, who made me laugh when her lips tickled down my neck and whose hands felt as natural as my own when sliding down my hips. Sarah, who'd said she loved me years ago between the hot kisses in the barn behind my house, her over me and me yielding back to say it, yielding my body to hers. That last day, she wore a yellow sundress and her hair being gold in the daylight. We're leaving tonight. Maybe you can come join us just to look, like a vacation, and we'll pay for a ticket back to, you know, to see if Offworld is a good fit for you. We sat with our feet dangling atop the fire escape on the atmosphere processor, close to the marketplace, our secret spot, to view the starships bobbing up and down beyond the mountains and colony walls. Can you think about it at least, Sarah asked. And I said, no, not really. When she stood up, I asked, is this a breakup then? Knowing we'd never work long distance, light years, that incalculable rift. We'd already spoken on it. She was leaving, escaping, blipping off my world, and I didn't even choke up about it. It was more fact than anything else, a tangible thing of being there and then, not anymore. Guess so, her disappointment coding every word. I think deep down I was screaming, or I had been for a long time, and gotten used to the noise. I never screamed out, never pulled my hair, I held it down. It's not about me, I thought. Never was. Not when Mom and Yusuf and the whole of us would go extinct if I chose to leave it all behind. And, uh, and then no one else would know what happened here, on that ranch some man built when he brought his family chasing with him along the stars. And that's what I got for now. The rest of the story, if you guys are interested, is in volume number one of the Mesozoic Reader. I don't know. Thank you, guys. Hello, hello. Hi, I'm Doug Henderson. I'm going to be reading from the Cleveland Heights LGBTQ Sci-Fi and Fantasy Role-Playing Club. The audience was pressed so tightly together, there couldn't possibly be any room closer to the stage. But Albert pulled Ben forward through the mob of banging heads, swinging hair, and pumping fists. Last night, when Ben called Celeste for advice, Celeste had said, I can't believe you're going to, with Albert to a Samurai Carey show. They're the most evil band ever. It's not like it's a date or anything, and how evil is that? I don't know, I've never seen them, but that's their marketing. Samurai Carey, the most evil band ever. As Albert pulled him toward the crowd, Ben tried to make himself as small as possible, but there were too many throbbing bodies pressed together. Ben found himself resisting, falling behind. The crowd swayed left and Ben was forced to sway with it. Albert's grip slipped from his wrist and Ben was pushed further away from him. Ben called out for help in a panic, but the crowd swayed to the right and he lost sight of Albert's black t-shirt. 
from behind, a body crowd surfing above the mob fell onto Ben and pushed him to the ground. He fell hard on his hands and knees, down amongst the spilled beer and the broken bottles. Albert, he called, but his voice was lost amongst the boots and the shoes. Ben had told Celeste he was afraid he might get killed at a show like this. Head spinning, ears ringing, Ben pushed himself off the floor through the mass of legs and arms as though he were digging out of his own grave. Albert! He yelled against the suffocating roar of the band. And then Ben felt a familiar grip around his wrist, and Albert was there again, grinning, squeezing his way back through the crowd. Stay close, Albert said. Don't stop. Moving behind Ben and putting his hands on Ben's shoulders, Albert pushed Ben through the crowd. Just keep it going. They pushed their way through until a thrashing wall of bodies, just a few feet from the stage, prevented them from going any further. This is close enough, Albert yelled. His unshaven chin was rough against Ben's ear, and that sent a jolt through Ben's body. He placed a hand on Ben's shoulder and held him back. Ben wasn't sure if Albert's hand was there to protect him or to keep him from being separated again, but it was a comforting weight either way. For the first time, Ben had a clear view of the stage in the band. The lead singer was bent over and barking into his microphone. He was shirtless and wore a samurai helmet over his long black hair. To the left and the right, the bass player and the guitarist stood in giant black coffins, and in the back, the drum kit was mounted atop a giant bat with a glowing red pentagram in its open mouth. The, speakers ch the music chugged out of the speakers in such overwhelming waves, even the beat of Ben's heart succumbed to the rhythm. The crowd began to jump wildly, long hair swinging. The best part is coming up, Albert said. Get ready. Behind the lead singer, the center of the stage burst open in a ring of crepe paper flames. From within, something red with a barbed tip began to emerge, slowly inflating, growing longer and thicker. It's the unholy cock of Satan. Ben stood transfixed as it rose, dwarfing the band and the amps. The noise of the crowd drowned out all thought as it climbed higher. It didn't stop when its head touched the rafters. Even then it grew until it was bent and looming over the stage in the mass of sweaty bodies below. It was circumcised, which didn't make any sense to Ben. Clearly someone hadn't really thought the whole thing out very well, but before he could point this out to Albert, the crowd surged forward, roaring. Ben and Albert were pushed toward the stage into the wall of slick, fleshy skin. Ben thought for sure he would be crushed, but unseen hands began lifting him up, pushing him higher and higher until he was surfing above the crowd. No, put me down. Ben tried to push back against the hands. Albert! Ben kicked and flailed as the hands passed him from one to the other, rolling him from his back to his stomach and back again. Ben called for help, but no one tried to save him or pull him back to the floor. No bouncers, no security. Ben struggled, but he couldn't stop the hands as they carried him towards the stage, towards the thrashing band and the enormous quivering shaft. Help, he cried. Stop, but to no avail. Ben rolled onto the black stage like a beached dolphin. Quickly rising to his hands and knees, Ben searched the crowd for Albert for some type of support amongst the sea of faces, but Albert was nowhere to be found. Of course this would happen. Out of all the people in the crowd, he would be the one tossed on stage. Ben climbed to his feet. Two muscular stage hands and leather harnesses picked him up by the arms. Welcome to the show, they said. He tried to resist, but they stripped off his jacket and t-shirt to the cheering approval of the crowd. The air on stage was hot and humid, pulsing. It laughed at Ben's body like a dirty tongue. He wanted to run, but the stagehands had a firm grip on his bony shoulders. They took him to the bat's open mouth and strapped his wrists to the giant pentagram. What are you doing? There's been a mistake. I don't even like this music. Just play along and have fun, 
They passed him a heavy golden chalice encrusted with plastic jewels. Drink. What is it? The jizz of Satan. They poured the liquid down Ben's throat. It tasted like the blood of Christ, like a cheap red wine. It burned and he coughed it up. The wine ran down his chest in red trails. The crowd roared. The band played harder and faster, swinging their hair in circles. There's going to be an explosion, the stagehands said. We'll only have five seconds to put this goat head on you. What? And you'll need to step into these furry pants. Before Ben could ask what the hell they were talking about, the front of the stage erupted in a showering wall of sparks. The lights went out. The stagehands shoved the goat mask over his head and yanked the pants up his legs. On the count of five, the lights returned, dim and red. The bass player pounded out a low rhythm. Beyond the stage, the crowd was hushed, writhing under the dark lights. The goat mask fit awkwardly, and Ben wasn't looking out through the eyes, but through the mouth, over the plastic teeth. Sweat ran down his back as he struggled to break free of the straps that still held him to the pentagram. But then, a spotlight fell upon him. The guitar and drums kicked in, and the lead singer screamed into his mic. The writhing mob went wild. The stagehands released Ben's straps. He took a step forward, but the furry pants were baggy and heavy. He fell to his knees. The lead singer turned to Ben, and from under his black helmet, he growled, Rise, my horny homunculus. Rise and dance for me. Even muffled by the mask, the sound of the music in the cheering crowd was deafening. Lights spun wildly. Shirtless men screamed and pumped their fists. Dance, they chanted, dance. And somewhere among them, although Ben couldn't see where, Albert was watching, waiting for Ben to act. Thanks, everyone. Have a good night. The entrance is rearranging. The entrance is rearranging. A black door is no longer center. Memory palace of perfect likeness. As in the way the mind itself forgets, then fills in transparent squares with Mexican summers. Joseph Albers also visited the Otihuacan with a beloved. I haven't. Through a gate, a flight of stairs leads to an overlooked garden, overwhelmed with bleached irises. She is small enough to trip on the last step and be helped up. The entrance is rearranging. A black door is no longer center. Where was it before? Memory palace of perfect likeness. As in the way the mind itself forgets and fills in transparent squares with Mexican summers. Joseph Albers also visited the Otihuacan with a beloved. I haven't. The regate a flight of stairs leads to an overlooked garden overwhelmed with bleached irises whose pistols shine like needles. In the southern corner, electronics hang against corkboard. They will play hide and seek there later. She is small enough to trip on the last step and be helped up. She will undust herself. From the open kitchen window, the smell of sweet arroz. Memory is a VHS with scratchy footage. The entrance is rearranging. The black door is decentered. Where was it before? Memory palace of perfect likeness as in the way the mind itself forgets renovations, then fills in transparent squares with Mexican summers, anise, and blood orange. Joseph Albers also visited the Otihuacan with a beloved, I haven't. The regate of flight of stairs leads to an overlooked garden overwhelmed with white roses and bleached irises whose pistols shine like needles. In the southern corner, electronics hang against torn corkboard. 
They will play hide and seek there later. She is small enough to trip on the last step and be helped till you will attempt to undust her dress. From the open kitchen window, the smell of sweet arroz, canela, con leche, cajeta, the displacement of objects. Memory is a VHS with scratchy footage. Play it back. By age six, she knew when to prepare herself for the cousins. In this place, every day is the same, except for when it wasn't. The entrance is rearranging. A black door is painted, middle gray is still opaque, memory palace of perfect likeness is in the way the mind itself forgets, then fills in transparent squares with Mexican summers. Joseph Albers also visited the Otihuacan with a beloved. I haven't. On the day the sun returned to the Tropic of Cancer, we went to Xochicalco. That light should permeate every cave, cavity, crevice of the body until becoming constant, omnipresent. Through a gate, a flight of stairs leads to an overlooked garden, overwhelmed with white roses, bleached irises, and pistols, and marigolds whose pistols shine like needles. On the southern border, women disappear forever. They will play hide and seek there later. She is small enough to trip on the last step and be helped up. She will undust herself. He will attempt to undust her dress. His fingers linger. From the open kitchen window, the smell of sweet arroz, canela, con leche, cajeta, the displacement of object, you dip Maria, cookies and coffee. VHS memory is a VHS with scratchy footage. Play it back. By age six, she knew when to prepare herself for the cousins. By age nine, she knew when to hide. In this place, every day is the same, except for when it wasn't. Soggy toilet paper is what we pretend is food. They put chicken on the table, and we are told to get tortillas. Somewhere, Coca-Cola arriving suddenly to the vanishing point. The entrance is rearranging. A black door is painted. What was here before? memory palace of perfect likeness, as in the way the mind itself forgets and fills in transparent squares with Mexican summers, anise, and blood orange, beer foam, and cotton. Joseph Albers also visited the Otihuacan with the beloved. I haven't. On the day the sun returned to the Tropic of Cancer, we went to Xochicalco. That light should permeate every cave, cavity, crevice of the body until becoming constant, omnipresent. Do I want to remember? The regate of flight of stairs leads to an overlooked garden overwhelmed with white roses, bleached irises, and marigolds whose pistols shine like needles. On the southern border, women disappear forever. They will play hide and seek there later. Machismo culture demands he count first. She is small enough to trip on the last step and be helped up. She will undust herself. He will attempt to undust her dress and his fingers will linger. Traces of past actions mark the unclean. From the open kitchen window, the smell of sweet arroz, canela, con leche, cajeta, the displacement of object, you dip Maria cookies and coffee. Give it to me, Black. Memory is a VHS with scratchy footage. Play it back. Can I return this? By age six, she knew when to prepare herself for the cousins. By age nine, she knew when to hide, lace doilies on glass, reveal mishandling dirty fingerprints. In this place, every day is the same, except for when it wasn't. Soggy toilet paper is what we pretend is food. Sometimes I'm walking down the street and relive a dark room. They put chicken on the table, and we are told to get tortilla. Somewhere Coca-Cola. Adults leave us alone. Arriving suddenly to the vanishing point. Fine. He takes off his shirt. Every year, abordamos un avión al Distrito Federal. Start of it all. Once there was wonder. The entrance rearranged, a black door opened. Would you know if it was closed before? Memory palace, a perfect likeness, as in the way the mind itself forgets, then fills in transparent squares with Mexican summers, anise and blood orange, beer foam and cotton. On the day the sun returned to the Tropic of Cancer, we went to Xochicalco. 
that light should permeate every cave, cavity, crevice of the body until becoming constant, omnipresent. Clever the way Mayans adjoin the temple to the plaza, moving its people in an infinite circle. Errors are inevitable. Is that what this was? Slowly, she let it unravel, each square inch piling onto the linoleum floor, thread by thread, pearlescent. The regate of flight of stairs led to an overwhelmed garden, overlooking white roses, bleached irises, and marigolds whose pistols shone like rusted needles in the southern corner, electronics hung against torn corkboard. Spare parts disappeared forever. They would play hide and seek there later. De the machismo culture still demands that he count first. She was small enough to trip on the last step and be helped up. She will undust herself. He attempted to undust her dress. His fingers lingered. Traces of past actions still marked the unclean. Dust of dirt on aging fingers. From the open kitchen window, the smell of sweet arroz, canela con leche. Cajeta, the displacement of objects. Not every reverie is unimportant. Three Maria cookies on a red plastic plate. Sunlight through a window hit shadow at the perfect angle. The VCR ripped right through the good images. Can I return this? By age six, she knew when to prepare herself for the cousins. By age nine, she knew when to hide. Lace doilies on glass revealed mishandling dirty fingerprints. Someone folded their hands on their lap. And this place every day is the same except for when it wasn't. Sometimes I'm walking down a street, we live a dark room. In violent avoidance of thick blankets. They put chicken on the table and we were told to get tortilla. Somewhere Coca-Cola, adults and their nescience left us alone. What is an amnesis worth? Would arrive suddenly to a vanishing point. Fine, he took off his shirt, syntax of discomfort. Every year, abordamos un avión al distrito federal, start of it all. Once there was wonder. Memory works in systems, striving for completion, negate and negating it. No me fregues. When he was finished, he would throw off the blanket and wash his hands. And so memory unfolds in moments. New York Times. The four-minute SpaceX flight ended in what the company called a rapid, unscheduled disassembly, meaning it exploded. What's your kink, you ask? I mean, like, what are you into? Is it strangulation, role-play, kidnapping? You want it to be dangerous, something you've never done before, and hot, and you want to tell your friends about it over brunch, and you want them to spit up their mimosas and scream. You want something to be afraid of, as if we both don't know, as if we all don't know how it ends. This poem, this planet, this night, so fine. My kink is rockets, Eden. Let's do it like Voyager, the spaceship with a mixtape, drifting out of our universe like you someday from me, past Jupiter, past Neptune, past a place where you won't even feel it when our Earth burns. Earth to Voyager, still here. Earth to Voyager, leaking pipelines. Earth to Voyager, how could you leave all this? If when you leave, you can't picture the end of my world, try this. A black moth over a green forest folds and folds the whole thing up in its wings like you used to me. Let's hit it like this planet, like this poem, like Voyager's mixtape. Play me! I'll tell you what we were. A whale drifting in a living ocean, infinite shape in an infinite shape, a bat clutching a berry, just people out for literature under an empty sky. Or, let's do it like Challenger. The one that soared and burned in 73 seconds The way our bodies, poems, planets eventually will Fall apart, become fireworks, become someone else's Orion While in the cockpit the astronaut recalls her yearbook inspirational Reach for the moon, if you miss you'll land among the stars Reach for the moon, if you miss you'll die screaming in the crash of hot metal And every machine blinking emergency Reach for the moon, they'll find your heart fused to the upholstery and your smoking femurs open to the Milky Way. 
I want to do it like the apocalypse, like this poem, like Challenger's structural failure. Let me cling to you. Let me die hard. When no one is left to find me, let them find me holding ice caps, long stanzas, oil slicked birds, spaceships together with my hands, saying, hold on, we can fix this. I can still kiss you. I can still <gasps> breathe. Help me up. As if 73 seconds of space flight shouldn't be enough for anyone. As if 73 years was an average for everyone. As if 73 billion years could ever be enough for anyone with you or Paris or Siberian tigers or climate. But if we're lucky, we get to do it like Cassini. The snap happy little rocket always programmed to crash into Saturn into the thing it most loved, like it didn't matter, no big deal, pretending to be chill. Let's do it like the apocalypse, like this poem, like Cassini, not like it doesn't end, not like we can fix it, but reporting back at every moment, look at those rings, and all the way down I'd be taking pictures, tree, polar bears, lovers, whale, selfies, landscapes, look at those rings, watch me burn. Over mimosas, talk about how like Cassini, we fired our retro rockets for one last look to Earth. Smile, we'd say, cheers, do you read me? I am speaking to you with my eyes, with your eyes on this. Do you read me? Let's do it like this planet. Like we are programmed to burn while everything burns around us. Like they built us from a dying planet to crash into one we can't live on, which is loving at the end of the world. And we'd be going down and I'd be going down on you. And the whole way, we'd be taking pictures, taking measurements, taking selfies, sending love. Click, as if to say, can you believe it? We are here, we are here. We were here over and over, as if it could possibly ever matter. Hashtag no filter, the coral reef is almost gone. Hashtag blessed, who gets to see Saturn? Me! This is the last Siberian tiger, hashtag YOLO. Which is how a machine from a dying planet says I love you, even for one night, like it could possibly matter. But if anyone wants to know, that's what we were doing here. Melting fuselage, calibrating thrusters, firing, firing payloads, and blowing our guidance systems. That's what we were doing here, all the way down up until the end. All the way down up until it ends. Flip Cheek Saloon! Please, everybody, give it up one more time for Amy K. Bell, wherever she is. <laughs> Emily Vuss, Doug Henderson, Kiana Shaley, Sear Becker, and Deb Bot Shipwreck Detective. All of these fine people have many things that you could buy online and in person, so go and talk to them if you want to purchase their wares. Otherwise, find them online. We also have a QR code. All the money that we get for Club Cheek Sloop goes to the performers. So please, share, buy art, go forth, and be beautiful. Thank you.